Today, I'm going to show you how to use the Pluto valve to get amazing water drop images. So let's get into it right now. Hello, my name is Carl Constantine and welcome to my channel on macro photography. If this is your first time here, and you enjoy learning about macro photography, please click that subscribe button and ring that bell so you don't miss a single episode. Today I'm going to take you through the full setup and process of photographing water drop collisions. So for that you kind of need a few different things. First of all you're going to need uh, some sort of water drop mechanism. Uh, this video is focusing on using the Pluto valve and how it works. There are many different systems out there I've chosen this one. The other thing you need that is very, very important is you need a flash, a dedicated speed light. The one on your camera is not going to be good enough for this style of work. You need to be able to set the power down very, very low. It's actually the flash that actually stops the image in the water drop collision. It freezes the frame, which exposes on your camera, and that's what you see. This isn't the same as high speed photography in the strictest sense of the word, where you try and increase, uh, make your shutter speed on your camera really super fast to try and stop that motion. Everything is done with the flash. You don't need a lot of flashes. You can do it with just one. Uh, I am choosing to use two for today's video. And you can even use more than that, depending on how creative you want to be. But a dedicated flash is very important. If you do not have one, I recommend uh, looking at what your camera supports uh, and checking uh, your local suppliers or Amazon for uh, a flash unit. This particular one is a Yuongo uh, 560 speed light um, that I'm going to be using for today. Another thing that is very, very important to use is a tripod. Uh, any tripod will do as long as you have a method of keeping your camera secure. This is not the style of photography that is conducive to doing handheld macro. You need a way to stabilize your camera, keep it focused on a very specific spot, and then not change it unless you have to later. Very, very important. The other thing you're going to need is something with which to catch the water drops. This is just a very simple plastic uh, bowl that actually came from uh, a fast food microwave, excuse me, uh, food tray. Nice and easy. You can pick up different things at a local buck or two store, different shapes, different sizes. You don't need anything very deep. Oddly enough, you can use something as small as a cookie sheet. Uh, you need a little bit of depth, but you don't need a lot. Uh, these drops tend to not go too far below the surface beyond about half an inch. So that's something to think about. The other thing you need that is very important is something with which to catch the overspray. I am just got this big tray. Uh, you can use anything because as your bowl gets, or you reservoir gets very full and is up to the brim, water is going to spill out, drops are going to get everywhere, um, and it's very nice to have a bit of a catch-all. And then when you're done, trying to hold that bowl very gently so you're not spilling everywhere doesn't always work. So you just pour a little off into the catch-all tray, you tend to have an easier time at cleanup. Oddly enough, one thing you don't need is a dedicated macro lens. You can use pretty much any lens you want for this style of work. Uh, and in fact, a one-to-one -one macro shot is not really what you're looking for here. Because all you're going to see is just a blur of water, which isn't what you want. Or you might get a collision that is well outside of the frame, which also is not what you want. You can use a dedicated macro lens, you just don't need to use the full one-to-one -one macro setup. It just, it's not necessary. Most of the shots uh, that I've posted recently on my Instagram page, you can check it out uh, in the link at the bottom. 
uh, you can are actually done at one quarter macro uh, using my Laura lens. So that's covering some of the uh, bases. Let's get into it. We're going to set it all up right over here. So the Pluto app is set up to work with different parts of the water uh, Pluto valve system. You have a setting here for flash delay, a setting for drop size, drop two delay, drop two size, and you can even input a third set of drop parameters if you choose. I haven't played a lot with the third drop system, uh, but it is something I am going to do. The value of each of these is in milliseconds. So it's a very, very short period of time. By default, each section of the app has a delay of five millisecond increments. But you can control that through the step parameter here if you want to change it to just one step and you can go up in one step increments. If you want to change it uh, to a different setting, you can. I find five is decent. Now the interval setting allows you to do successive uh, images at a particular interval. Great for testing, not something I've used very much myself and just something you kind of have to explore. So for now, what you want to do is you want to test one drop. You want to see how long it takes for that drop to get from the valve to the water and form a crown, form a splash. So let's see what we get here. Make sure that my camera hasn't gone to sleep or my flashes. All right. Oh, the valve must have gone to sleep, or maybe it is not quite plugged in. Let me just double check it. Okay. Of course, it helps if I actually set a drop size for the valve to actually trigger. So I'm going to start with a relatively small drop size of about 40. And notice also that the drop size is also measured in milliseconds. And that just means how long the solenoid in the valve opens for to form a drop. drop. So we're going to go for a 40 millisecond drop size, a flash delay of 350 milliseconds, and we are going to write this down, F350 S40 just so I know later, because I can go up or down depending on what I want to do. So let's see how that works. Now in this case, uh, I got the drop to hit the water and start to come back up. That column is called a Worthington jet. It was named after uh, A.M. Worthington, who did a study back in 1908. Basically what has happened is the drop has come down, hit the water, gone into the water, and come back up, and that's the result you see. It's a good idea to do several drops uh, to make sure that everything is relatively consistent. And I'm getting some fairly consistent jets at this point. Uh, I seem to have bypassed the initial splash phase. I took a guess at a couple numbers just based on previous experience. Uh, so one thing you want to do when you are planning your water drops is test for when you get that initial splash and it forms that crown-like structure and then increase your flash time beyond that. 
Now these Worthington jets can get fairly high and you want to know roughly where the top level is for your setup and mixture. That means in incrementally, incrementally, there we go, increasing the flash delay to see where that hits. That point is actually very, very short and the water will actually start to recede very, very quickly and go back in uh, to the water. So now what I really want to do is I want to try and create a collision. Before I do that, I need to be able to increase the time between the dots. And this system doesn't seem to like anything less than about 50 or 60 millisecond delay. If you do a 10 millisecond delay between drops, it basically turns into all one big glob and that is, will not turn out the way you want. So I'm going to set my drop delay here at 60 milliseconds. And once again, I want to try and figure out how long of a drop I want to create, how big of a drop. I'm going to create a small one of about 20 milliseconds. Now all this adds up. So 40 millisecond first drop, 60 millisecond before the second drop, and 20 millisecond stop size. You add all these up, it gives you a total of 120 milliseconds, which still is plenty given that flash delay. Now the trick is to try and get those settings, of course, to make a collision in your image. So let's try these settings, make sure my camera hasn't gone to sleep again. I'm going to take a quick blank shot and I'm going to record these settings. So size of 40, an interval of 60, size of 20 and flash at 350. Now that I've written those down, let's see what we get. Now in that image, the flash has captured it such that the water drop is already receded back into the water. I'm going to do a couple more just to see. Now on that one, it looks like the drop has actually hit it at a lower point. All right, so I'm fairly consistent in terms of not getting the collision. Now I have to figure out exactly where that collision point is. Is it earlier before my flashes go off? or is it later after my flashes go off? So what I'm going to do is, so you don't have to completely watch that, I'm going to play with these numbers here a little bit, and then I'll get back to you once I've figured it out. All right, so I've taken a little bit of time here. Fortunately, not very long, actually, as it happens. Uh, I decreased my flash delay to 325 milliseconds down from the 350 I used previously. I left all other settings the same. So in those shots, we are getting some relatively consistent collisions. And as you can see, each one looks just a little bit different than the one previous. So once you have some good collisions and you're getting some consistent images, you can play a little bit. You can do things like add a little food coloring to either the water in the valve and or the water uh, in the reservoir. You can add milk. You can try and get uh, some additional color there in pretty much any way you like.
All right, so what I've done is I've added some food coloring to the, uh, the liquid, rather, in the Pluto valve. And then I've added a few drops to the water reservoir as well to see if we can get some multicolor type collisions. So let's see what we get, shall we? Okay, we're getting a couple interesting things. I'm going to actually increase the distance between the dots here, or the drops rather, just a little to see if I can get a little bit better collision. So I've played around a little bit further and I'm getting a little bit different uh, collisions as you can see. Now one of the big problems with this setup where the valve is connected to or rather the trigger rather is connected to my camera and I've got a wireless uh, trigger to set off my flashes is there is a delay between the time my wireless trigger goes off and the flashes go off which often is just a little bit too long to catch a good collision. So there is a different way to set things up with a valve. The Pluto trigger comes with a special cable that connects the trigger directly to your flashes through the PC port. Now, as I mentioned last video, not all uh, external flashes actually have a PC port, so do check that yours does in order for this to work. What happens there is one flash is set to manual and connected to the Pluto trigger. The other flash is set to a slave mode, so it's triggered by the other flash going off. In addition, I have still have the trigger on my camera and I have to operate two things at one time. I set the valve off with the app on my phone and then I have an additional remote trigger to trigger my camera. Now for this kind of setup you need things to be very dark because the camera is set for long exposure between half a second and one second. The flashes are still at 1 128th power and they are set to capture the splash. Additionally, if I want, I can also trigger them to reflect off the, my background and change my background up and let that reflection capture the flash. And it works actually very, very, very well. I get very consistent images that way um, just because I'm not dealing with that extra flash delay. So I can't show you that on video, but here are some images that I have captured using that method. The process of capturing water drop images using the second method is exactly the same as if you're going to connect directly to your camera. You want to time how long it takes for that very first drop to hit the water and make a bit of a splash, how long it takes for that flat, that splash rather, to form a Worthington jet, and then you want to play with parameters to try and make a collision within that exact same period of time. I should also mention that if you're using food coloring with your water drops that the splashes do create a bit of a mess and can potentially stain uh, equipment and things around it. So do make sure you clean up very quickly uh, after yourself.
if you're using that. One thing to consider when you're playing with water drop collision images is you can get very, very creative. You could try doing splash images hitting an object. You can try doing splash images uh, like this one from Tracy Harris, where she used an egg and a splash image. Absolutely fantastic idea. And she gave me permission to show you this image today. I'm going to put a link to her Instagram in the description below. Get creative. Don't just limit yourself to this kind of setup. Use your imagination a little bit. Once you feel comfortable uh, creating images, you can do all kinds of amazing, amazing shots. Next week, we'll take a look at importing our images into Lightroom and the workflow process that I use when I'm dealing with macro images. And we're going to edit a few of the images that we created today. If you haven't seen the first video of this series, click this link right here. Do remember to subscribe, stay safe, and remember that in the macro world, we make little things a big deal. See you next week.